Well, again, we're continuing in our foundation series. Last week we spoke about how the gospel is the foundation for a church. The gospel is the only foundation as we start out for the church. And now we move to the second foundation, which is the scriptures. So once we have the gospel and we could see for the first time Christ for who he is, now the question is, well, who is Christ? What is Christianity? And how do we know what it is? So today we'll talk about scripture as our only infallible rule and authority. And so now I ask you to open up God's word to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. This is really important. What we're doing right now is opening God's word, seeking to explain that. That way we receive not the thoughts of man, but the thoughts of the Bible. This is Paul's final letter. Paul here is in prison. He's subject to death, and he's giving young Timothy his last instructions before he is to die. Okay? We'll see what Paul wants Timothy to know as his last instruction. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. All scripture, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof and for correction, for training in righteousness, that the, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Let's pray real quick again as we ask the Lord to bless the preaching. Lord, again, we come before you. Thank you that we've been able to sing praises to your name, Lord. Thank you that we've been able to sing songs that are about you and that glorify your name, Lord. And now as we turn to the preaching of your word, Lord, as we open up your word, your scripture, Lord, give us the ability now to understand it, Lord. Give us the ability myself, Lord, to preach it and to teach it in a way that's edifying and it's even captivating, Lord. So we pre- we ask that you would be with us now as we open up your word. Well, in 1832, there was a guy named Joseph Smith. Joseph Smith was said to have a vision from God. If you guys aren't familiar with who Joseph Smith is, Joseph Smith is the leader of the Church of Latter-day Saints, commonly known as Mormons. Okay, in this vision, Joseph Smith said that the angel of the Lord appeared to him, okay, and said that all the churches were corrupt and wrong, and that he w- and that the angel of the Lord would take him to a place and show him where the true religion was. And so in this vision, Joseph goes to this mysterious spot and finds these golden tablets, okay, and then God gives him glasses to be able to read these golden tablets. Because it was in ancient Egyptian. At that time, the Rosetta Stone had not made it to the state. So no one really knew what ancient Egyptian was. So you see him there with these special glasses reading these golden tablets. And quote unquote, restoring Christianity to, its, to the truth. And this, these golden tablets were called another testimony. Another testimony when Christ supposedly came to the Americas and preached to the Indians. And it was his life here in the Americas. That's pretty wild, right? Should we believe Joseph Smith? What about SDA leader Alan G. White? She claims to have had 2,000 visions from God. 2,000 visions from God. And that's more than some of the prophets in the Bible, right? So 2,000 visions, and one of her main significant visions was what actually gave the Seventh-day Adventist Church their name. She said that she saw the law of God, and around the fourth commandment, which is remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, she saw a halo. And that confirmed to her that, oh man, we should be worshiping on Saturday and not Sunday. And in fact, they would say that anyone who worships on Sunday has the mark of the beast on them. Interesting again, right? What about Muhammad of Islam? Again, when he was around 50, he gets carried up to God by the angel Gabriel, right? And he's said to be before the throne of God, passing by Moses and Abraham on the way there. And he's standing there before God. He's given revelation to what true religion was. And then Muhammad goes on to teach in the Quran that Jesus was just a prophet. He was no greater than Abraham or Moses or Noah. He was just a prophet. In fact, they uphold the virgin birth. They, they uphold his, Jesus' miracles. But then they say at the crucifixion that another man that looked like Christ took his place there. And Christ hid away and ran and he was carried up to God. So in Muhammad's Islam, Muhammad's version of Christ, someone dies for Christ. But in Christianity, Christ dies for us. 
But what about there's a big popular church right now that says that there's a man when he speaks ex cathedra from the seat that he is declaring forth the truth of God. I think you guys know who this man is. His, man, his name is the Pope. The Pope says that whatever he speaks regarding faith is the word of God. He calls himself the vicar of Christ. He's here instead of Christ. And when he speaks, again, it's as if God is speaking, so he says. So that's how they can promote things like there's salvation in the Virgin Mary. There is an actual a treasury of merit that we could pay money to and receive merit so that we can be accepted before God. But again, all these people are competing for the truth. All these people are saying that they have received visions from God or they have the power of God and they're putting the authority on something other than the word of God. This one just breaks my heart. Jim Jones. You guys know who Jim Jones is? Anyone? Jim Jones in the 60s and 70s started a movement of people that look like us, minorities, right? Not really wealthy. And he started a movement and he led a bunch of people to believe and be deceived, saying he was God, that he was, he was the Messiah, right? And he was all about liberation for the minorities. He was all about destroying the system and lifting up the minorities, the blacks, the Hispanics, to a state of power. And anyone who opposed him was part of the white man's religion. And he buys this huge property, and he takes all these people to this property, and he again, he's preaching. And you could, if you guys ever want to, I, I have to warn you, though, it's really heavy. All the audio of this stuff is filmed, okay? And when I, when I, read, when I listened to it, it... It just I, I remember I went home that day and told Isabel, like, this is killing me. You have all these people being promised by Jim Jones that he's God and that they need to drink this cup. It's filled with poison in order to receive heaven because the government was going to come overtake them. Okay? And when you listen to this audio, there's little kids drinking the poison. You can hear them screaming as they're dying. All because those people did not know the Word of God. They put their authority in Jim Jones and not the Word of God. And there's people that are physically dying, committing suicide without even knowing it, thinking they're going to inherit the kingdom of God when they actually don't. And that, that moves us, right? The cults move us to be upset with them. But what we don't realize is what's happening physical there, the physical death there, it's happening all the time spiritually when people are promoting other things other than the Word of God. We, we don't see that death, that spiritual death, but people are being led astray when they start to preach other things that aren't taught in the Word of God. All of these people are denying the sufficiency of Scripture. They're denying that the Scripture is the only infallible rule and authority. So that you might ask me, well, why are you preaching then if it's only the Scripture? Why don't we just read the Scripture? The point is that we explain the scriptures. What I don't do is I don't come and bring a message and then find verses to fit my message. What I do is I read the scripture and then bring a message that's out of the scriptures, right? All this extra revelation, all this receiving visions from God is essentially saying that the Bible is not enough. The word of God is not enough. It's an outdated source. Let's get rid of it. And now let's start preaching what we think. It really just comes down to these words. Has God really said? Has God indeed said? In fact, that's what Satan in the garden told Eve, right? Genesis 3.1 says, Now the serpent was more crafty and cunning than any other, any other beast in the field. And he said to the woman, Has God really said that you cannot eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil? Again, questioning God's word is what caused all of humanity to be in the state that it's in. It's what brought in sin. Because then now Eve is wondering, well, did God really say that? And now she partakes of the fruit. And now with Adam and Eve, we all are plunged into sin. So at the root of our corruption is a denial of God's word, is a denial of God has really spoken on the matter. See, Satan doesn't care if he deceives all of you guys with full-on atheism. All these people that I read about, Joseph Smith, Alan G. White, the Muhammad of Islam, Jim Jones, right, the Roman Catholic Church, they all use the name of God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit. They all have a little bit of Bible with them, just enough Bible so you think, oh, yeah, they're, 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 they're legit. 
but then they twist it and have their own agenda. So Satan doesn't care if he flat out gets you guys to be atheists. All Satan cares is that he deceives you enough by removing the word and convincing you of a lie. That's enough for Satan. Satan doesn't need full-blown atheism. He just needs you to not believe the essentials taught from the word. All these people ignored God's revealed will, and they saw extra-biblical revelation. And it's sad when people ignore what God has taught in his word. It's sad to see churches do it. Right? Just recently, there's been some, some headlines that came out, and this just shows you the state of Christianity at the moment. One of the most popular Christian contemporary artists, Lauren Daigle, I'm sure you guys know who she is, was asked if what her position was on homosexuality. I'm not saying that's an easy question to answer, but I think there is a biblical answer to it because God has spoken on the matter. Listen to what she says. Lauren Daigle says this, I cannot an- honestly answer that question. In a sense, she says, I have too many people that I love that they are homosexual. I don't know. I actually had a conversation with someone last night about it. I can't say one way or another, I'm not God. And quote. She's right. She's not God. She's clearly not God. But she's completely wrong because God is not silent on the matter. Again, I'm not saying that we go out and start handling this in a way that's rude or ugly. But what I'm saying is God is not silent. But clearly either Lauren Daigle doesn't know her Bible or she doesn't know God or what I honestly think it is, she's embarrassed of her God. She's embarrassed of who God has revealed himself to be in the scriptures. So now the question for us is, is the Bible enough for us? Are we going to uphold the scriptures with the pressures of the world? Are we going to uphold the scriptures even with the pressures of the church that want to take the scriptures out and be more relevant and cool? The point is, are we going to uphold the scriptures? Do we truly believe that the scriptures are the only infallible rule and authority for the church? So let me ask you guys, what would you guys tell these people? What would you tell Joseph Smith if you had the opportunity? What would you tell Alan G. White? What would you tell Muhammad of Islam or Jim Jones? What would you tell someone who was struggling with some sins that are hard for you to deal with? Would you begin to see, well, you know, I think God is kind of like this. Or, you know, it seems like God would, would be this way. Would, do you turn to your own emotions to govern the way you view God? Do you turn to what's easy to determine the way you view God? Or do you turn to the scriptures to determine the way you view God? Listen, we can't pick and choose what we want to believe in the Bible. We can't say, okay, this verse is nice. Okay, you know, for I know the plans that I have toward you, says the Lord. Plants are prosper. Yeah, Jeremiah 29, 11, give me that all day. And then Romans 1, we're like, oh, man, I don't know if I want to believe Romans 1, though. We can, either it's all true or it's all a, a lie. We can't pick and choose. This isn't a buffet. This is the word of God, and we must take all of it in as our only infallible rule. So, again, I really want you to ask yourself, because, you know, Mormon missionaries come to our door. Jehovah's Witness come to our door, and they know their stuff. And if Christians don't know where to turn to in their Bibles to be able to combat the false prophets and the cults of today, we're going to seem like we're the ignorant ones and they're the ones who really know their Bible. So I ask you, where would you turn? What would you say to these people? I think Vody Bauckham said it really well. Vody Bauckham is one of my favorite preachers. He says this, If we don't know the Bible, if we don't know doctrine, that means teaching from the Bible, If we don't know theology, that is the study of God from the Bible, listen, it is virtually impossible for us to identify false prophets. Virtually impossible, he says. We cannot give up the word of God, guys. Not in the church, not in our home life, not in our hearts. We must learn it. We must live it. We must love it. So now as we move on, I want to give just three historical, uh, three different settings, sorry, for the way that the Bible has shaped culture, the way the Bible has shaped the church, and the way that the Bible should shape our lives. Christians used to be called people of the book, historically. This is the first setting, historical setting. They used to be called people of the book, okay? So much so that in the first centuries, 
you know, when, when the Bible started going out to different parts of the world, obviously translation was needed, right? People needed to translate the Word of God into the new languages. Well, there's a story of a pastor who had received his new translation to be able to preach to the congregation, and one of the sentences was actually uh, missing from the Bible, from the translation. And it must have just been a copying error, which is okay. It happens. But when he was reading that section of Scripture to his congregation, they stopped him. And they said, what are you doing? Get out of here. You're, you're, you're stealing the Word of God from us. And he's confused because he doesn't know what's going on. And the point is that the people knew their Bible so well that when he skipped that one verse... They almost threw him out of the church. So he goes to the translator and tells him, what did you do to me? You robbed me of a verse and it almost got me kicked out of the church. I'll tell you, I could go to, uh, to, to some churches today and miss a whole section of, uh, of the Bible because no one's following along. No one knows their Bible that well. Remember, back then, you had to carry around the scriptures in a wheelbarrow because they were all wrapped up. It wasn't a nice little bind like this. It was heavy. So they had to memorize their Bible in order to be able to call out false teachers. But in our day, man, no one can even identify false teachers. The reason false teachers even exist is because we aren't able to identify the truth from the Word of God to call out false teachers. The Reformation in the 16th century really had its origins in the study of the Word of God. Martin Luther, a German monk, is wondering big questions like, how is a sinful man made right before a holy God? How do we reconcile these two things? And so he's studying Romans chapter 1, specifically verses 16 and 17. He's studying the Word, right? That's not really what was uh, encouraged in the monasteries. They were encouraged to do good works, climb up the, the stairs on their knees and pray the whole time. So he's reading chapter 1 of Romans And now the scripture opens up his eyes to see the just shall live by faith. We're saved by faith alone, through grace alone. So in the Reformation, really, all Protestant churches really have their root in the Reformation, if they're being honest. At the core of it was a discovery of the word of God. There's a Latin phrase that's called ad fontes. They went back to the source. They cut out the middleman. They went back to the source to see what the scriptures actually teach concerning salvation, concerning God, concerning justification and sanctification. So that's the historical setting, right? And Martin Luther, you know what he wanted? He said, you know what? We have the Latin Bible. No one reads Latin anymore. He said, we have high German. Well, no one knows how to read high German. Let's get the Bible into the common vernacular, the common language of the people so they can understand it. And you know what the, what the church said? That's dangerous. We can't put the Bible in commoners' hands. Because they knew that giving the people of God, the word of God, was dangerous for their cause. Because they were teaching falsehoods. But Martin Luther knew that if people with the Bible were dangerous people for the Lord. Listen, we're so blessed to be able to carry around our entire Bible with us everywhere we go. There's people in China that have no access to their Bible. In North Korea, that don't have access to the Bible. Countries where it's illegal to have a Bible. Right? And yet we have it. We have this beautiful buffet. And it's always just locked up in our closet. Never opened. We're so blessed to have the Word of God. That's the historical setting, okay? Now there's the church setting. I'm going to read something to you. It's from our what we would call our statement of faith here the 1689 London Baptist Confession of Faith. And it actually has a a really excellent um, definition of what the Bible is. Let me read that to you now. Chapter 1 of the Confession says this, The Holy Scripture is the only sufficient, certain, and infallible rule of all saving knowledge, faith, and obedience. Although the light of nature and the works of creation and providence do manifest the goodness, the wisdom, and power of God as to leave men without excuse, yet they are not sufficient to give that knowledge of God and His will which is necessary unto salvation. Let let me explain that real quick, okay? There's two types of revelation, okay? Revelation just means the way God reveals Himself. There's two types. There's general revelation, and that's when you look out, you see the mountains, you see the stars, you see the clouds, You see what God has created in nature, and that's called general revelation. To leave men without excuse, that all people know that God truly exists. They cannot deny that because the light of nature. 
But as the confession says, that is impossible for salvation to look at general revelation and be saved by it. So then there's another category, special revelation, meaning how God has revealed himself in a special way to certain people. And now it's recorded for us through the word of God. So you have general revelation and you have special revelation. Okay, one is no life. It is actually damns people. The other gives life and saves people from their damnation. And here's what's crazy. There are more people preaching about general revelation than they are about special revelation. There's more people giving talks on a podium that looks like a church about things that aren't revealed in Scripture, things that don't have life in them. The Scripture is the bread of life. The Scripture is what gives us life, as we read, as we sang about. And yet pastors are starving their sheep. If somehow we could see people in their spiritual state for who they really are, and you saw broad evangelicalism, you would see a bunch of skinny, weak, feeble sheep that can't even stand because they're not being fed the Word of God, what sustains us and gives us nourishment. And again, false prophets are really our fault because if we knew our Bibles, we'd be able to spot a false prophet, leave that church, and then, then diminish his ministry. Right? And sometimes when we think of some of the big churches and we think of you know, how sad it is for people to sit under their preaching, Paul actually says that they go to those churches because they want to hear that. They want their itchy ears to be satisfied. So the reason you have the likes of T.D. Jakes and all these prosperity teachers is because people want that. People want a prosperity-driven faith. They don't want a scripture-based faith. There's a quote by John Owen an old Puritan, and I think he, he nails this whole general revelation and special revelation really well. This is what he says. John Owen says, if private revelations, right, so all those visions we talked about, all those, you know, seeing God and all that, if private revelations agree with Scripture, then they are needless. But if they disagree, then they are false. So what he's saying is someone has a vision about oh, you know, God came to me and said, Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. Well, that's fine, but we already knew that, John 14, 6. So it's needless, right? And if they're false, then we don't need those anyways. The point is, when people have revelation claiming to know God, and it's actually in, in line with the Bible, it's like you're getting a cup of water and trying to throw it into the ocean to fill it. Oh, here's another revelation. It's like, no, we already have the ocean of God's word. We don't need these little cups of water thrown into them. So if private revelations agree with scripture, they're needless. If they're false, then they're lies, right? Let's go back to our text. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good word good work. You see, Paul there covers every aspect of life. The scripture is suitable for it all. See, the, the scriptures can't teach you how to, you know, perform brain surgery, but the scriptures can teach you how to be a moral doctor and not commit murder during that brain surgery. So the scripture is, is complete for every good work, as Timothy says. But what's interesting here, continuing with our setting of the church, as I said in the beginning, this is Paul's last letter before he dies. He's enchained. He is suffering. He's going to be most likely killed. And he charges Timothy for the last time. Timothy would have been essentially the next Paul, the next leader of the church, right? And let's, let's go to the next verses right after what our, our text for this morning. This is what Paul tells Timothy. I charge you... In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead by his appearing and his kingdom. Listen to what he says. I charge you, Paul says, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. Paul tells Timothy, preach the word. 
Paul doesn't tell Timothy, start this ministry or start up this program or have this type of worship or have these lights. No, he says, preach the word. Preach the word, Timothy. So listen, if I ever, from this pulpit, or if anyone else ever comes from this pulpit and preaches something that's contrary to the word of God, it is on you guys all to just get up and leave. Right? We need to be preaching the word in a way that's faithful to the text. And what's scary is that many churches have abandoned the principle of sola scriptura. Only what the Bible teaches can we, be, can we preach from the word of God. And so our last application, our last setting is your life. So we have the historical setting. We see how, how the word of God has helped the church of God in all the ages. We see how the word of God should be being preached in the church and Paul's charge to Timothy to preach the word. And lastly, you need the word in your life. You need the word to be the foundation for which you handle your relationships, for which how you go to work. The, the, the word tells us about that. How you parent your children. The word tells us about that. And especially how we know God. How we come to know God. Have we created for ourselves who we think God is? And then now that's what we worship. And by the way, that's called idolatry, creating a God in our own image. Or do we study the word, find out who God really is, and now worship that God? Listen, I'm convinced that if I were to go to so-called Christians and tell them who the real God of Scripture is, they would cease to believe in that God. Or they would think I'm crazy for revealing to them who God really is. Vodi Bakum again says this surrounding these thoughts. Vodi Bakum says, The modern church is producing passionate people with empty heads who love the Jesus they don't know very well. And he's absolutely right. Okay? Let me let me give you a little scenario to help this to help this illustration, okay? Let's say the year is nineteen fifty and people still write letters, okay? And these people are on opposite sides of the country. There's a young man and a young woman, and they keep writing letters to each other. Okay? The, the, the guy writes a letter to the, to the girl telling him about her. She opens up. She reads it. Now she writes a letter to him, and he gets the letter, and he just sets it down. And then he starts to write another letter. Okay? And then he sends it back to her. She opens up. She reads it. She writes him back. And then he gets that letter, and then just sits it down again. And this goes on and on for months. And then one of his friends come over, and say, hey, aren't you writing letters to this girl? And he says, yeah, I am. And he sees all the letters there that are piled up. Well, do you like her? You're not opening up any of her letters. And then the guy says, you know what? I love this girl. She loves me for who I am. She wants to do all the same hobbies that I want to do. She wants three or four children. She wants a wedding that costs $500. She's perfect for me. She's actually going to move here and leave her life behind to be with me. And yeah, you think to yourself, but all the letters... From her, right there, you've never opened one of them. You would think that guy is crazy to explain a woman that he's never even read about, learned about, leaving all those letters unopened. You would think that guy was insane to be able to describe someone he's never even read about. And that's literally what goes on in the modern church. So many people claim to know who God is and they make all these claims about God that are not concurrent with what the Bible actually reveals about who God is. And that's dangerous. But let's move on. So not only does the Bible help us to identify false prophets, not only does the Bible help us to not worship idols or become false prophets our, ourselves, but the Word of God is actually food for our soul. Food for our soul. You know, when Jesus was in the, the, the desert for 40 days, in 40 nights, he did not eat anything, right? And then Satan comes to him and says, turn these stones into bread so that you may eat of them. If you're really the son of God, turn these stones into bread. That way you can eat. And Christ says to him in Matthew 4.4, 4, let me turn there real quick. Matthew 4.4, 4, this is what Christ says to him. He says, but he answered, that is Jesus, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word 
that comes from the mouth of God. So the, the devil is saying, here, eat these stones and turn them into bread. And then Christ says, no, man should not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. And that's exactly it, right? When we are spiritually starving, when we are famished, what we need is not social media. We don't need to text our friends and be like, hey, man, can, I, can, can, can we meet, you know, meet up and go get some coffee? I'm feeling down. That's fine. But primarily what we need for our famished souls is the very word of God, is the bread of life. 1 Peter 2.2 talks about a baby yearning for its mother's milk. And Peter says, just as a baby yearns for the milk of its mother, that's the way you should be yearning for the word of God. And I'll tell you guys, when Lucy is hungry, she doesn't care what's going on in our schedule. She doesn't care where we are. She'll cry and cry and cry until she gets to eat. She doesn't understand the concept of waiting because that's how hungry she is for the milk of her mother. That's the way that Peter describes Christians. We should be so hungry for the word of God that we won't give it up. We won't do anything that will get in the way of us getting our daily bread. Right? Like John Piper said, if you have to choose between breakfast and the Bible, choose the Bible and get a breakfast bar and, and go on the road. That's how important this is to us. Now, I'm not going to make you raise your hands, but I would guess that most of us have not read our Bible this week. It's been sitting there all week, or we maybe we've turned to a, a scripture here and there, or we read the daily verse. Right? Again, we have a buffet of God's Word that is to nourish our souls and it's just left there on our tables and our counters. We need the spiritual food. If, if I were to go to a starving man on the street and say, here, I'm going to leave all this food right next to you, he would not just say, okay, thank you, and wait six days to eat it. No, that starving man would pick up all that food and devour it because he's hungry for the Word of God. Listen, when our souls are starving, that's the way we approach the Word of God. That's the way we need to see the Word of God. We can't turn to social media. We can't turn to our friends before we turn to the Word of the Lord. Now lastly, what about the Word of God in the place of our family life and our friendships? You know, when someone accuses you of living your life in a way that's contrary to the Word of God and they show you from the Word of God that you're living contrary to it, how do you react? Do you give in to your emotions do you give in to your pride or to your ego? Well, let me show you. If you do, then even though you claim to believe God's word, it doesn't govern your life. Right? If we're going to say that the scriptures are our sole authority for life and practice, when we are confronted with the word of God and see that our life doesn't line up with that, then we are actually bowing down to ourselves as our authority. We have, we have placed God and said, you know what, God, thank you for your word, but it's not really needed right now. What I need is for my own emotions, right? So when, he, when we're approached with the fact in Scripture that we're sinful, okay, and God is going to punish sinners, how do we address that? Do we say, no, God is all love. He would never punish sinners. Or do we say, what am I going to do? If the wrath of God abides in, on me, like Christ says, what am I going to do? Well, guess what the Bible also teaches about this man, Christ Jesus. In fact, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's really just one story of redemption of Christ. One story about sinners who need a Savior. So when we give up the Bible, essentially what we're doing is giving up Christ. Because from Genesis 3.15, when God promises Eve that her seed will crush the, the head of the serpent, to the end of Revelation, when we see that Christ is in heaven saying, I have won, I have conquered. It's one story about Christ. So when you're confronted with the fact that we're sinful, I'm sinful, and I need to pay the price of my sins, do we react to the word of God and say, Oh Lord, where else can we go? You have the words of eternal life. So listen, the scripture is not just some theological book that we're to study all day and night. The scripture is food for our souls, and it's actually the story of redemption for sinners who are on their way to hell. And that's the gracious story of the Bible, that Christ comes and saves a people for himself, that all who believe in him and throw themselves upon Christ will have everlasting life. We cannot leave this word alone. 
It tells us the story of humanity, of who God is, and who we are. Let's pray.